Ah, Lara, I've covered you once before, seven years ago. It was pretty rubbish, mind you. I wouldn't seek it out myself. Now, I've wanted to revisit Lara Croft and Tomb Raider again for quite some time, unhappy with my first attempt at doing it ages ago. And seeing as how I've been going through the first two games on the old Twitch channel, I've got the buzz to do it. If anyone deserves a proper, extensive video on how she originally managed to change the entire gaming world, well, it's Lara Croft. And I'm not sure if she's really had that. So, mainly using those first two games, a duo that I absolutely consider two of my very favourite games ever, let's see just how it all happened and how Lara came to essentially be the mascot of the whole PlayStation era. Now, the first time I did this video, I started with about five minutes on why the PlayStation became so cool back in the mid 90s. I'm not sure if you really need another go around on how it captured a more adult market and was a lot trendier and so on. There's a whole video on PlayStation adverts if you want that. So instead, let's go to 1994 and the quiet desk stroke office of a man named Toby Gard in the heart of Core Design's Derby Studios. He's not got much hair, but he is from Essex. And as such, he's obviously the big hero behind the scenes here. The initial ideas that Toby had for creating what would eventually be Tomb Raider came to him in the middle of 1994, at around the same time he was working on design for a Mega CD game called BC Racers. Does BC Racers have much to do with the creation of Tomb Raider? Well, not really. It's a mediocre Mario Kart clone featuring the guy who was probably Core's most famous character before Lara Mania kicked off, that being Chuck Rock and his family. Chuck Rock as a character is probably about as far removed from Lara Croft as you can possibly get. If any inspiration from this project did strike, it was because the bland and derivative nature of BC Racers may have driven Toby further towards wanting to do something brand new in 3D for the upcoming generation. That's the story that's often part of the narrative, anyway. Toby's idea was for an action-adventure on a scale that hadn't really been attempted in games to that point. If you were to elevator pitch it, you'd probably say that you wanted to create the video game version of Indiana Jones. And so early on, the initial sketches of Tomb Raider were of an Indiana Jones style with an Indiana Jones style hero, that is, one who was initially a bloke. That said, a little too much is often made of Tomb Raider initially featuring a male hero. It didn't go too far beyond the sketches. Pretty soon a female action hero had joined up with this unnamed fella, and Toby's initial ideas in sketching actually revolved around you being able to choose between two adventurers who would have two different stories, and two different sets of cinematics, and obviously two different models and voicing and… well you can probably see why this idea didn't last. Toby Guard soon realised that having two heroes meant two times all of the bloody work. So he made a choice. By this time, the female hero was a lot more fleshed out in both sketching and in character than the initial male one, so the choice was pretty easy to make. Who generally inspires this female hero then? This at the time South American hero who eventually picked up the name of Laura Cruz. Well, if you were to look at the world of games, there wouldn't be too much inspiration going around. There weren't exactly many games featuring such female protagonists back in the mid-90s beyond Samus in Metroid, or games with licenses such as Alien, where you could play as Ellen Ripley. The best that there was, in many cases, was being able to play as a female character in any of the various fighting games that were popular at the time. Chun-Li in SF2, Sonya in Mortal Kombat, Pi or Sarah in Virtua Fighter and so on. Indeed, Virtua Fighter was another place where Toby found indirect inspiration. He observed in the office that whenever Virtua Fighter was played, which was often, being that this was a game developer's studio and all, almost all of the fights would feature one player picking Pi or Sarah, or indeed both of the characters going against each other. Now I hardly need to tell you that Core Design staff was composed almost entirely of blokes at the time, it's a 90s game studio. So surely there was an appeal there, something that went against the traditional commercial mantra back then that creating a game based around a female protag was a form of company wide harakiri. Maybe just maybe that was a load of bullshit. This was, of course, another reason to attempt this game with a female hero, to try and break some new ground. 
Inspiration from outside of Games Lynn was drawn from various spots. Aside from the female Indiana Jones type thing, Toby wanted Lara to very much be a badass, gun-toting action hero. You can look back at stuff like Tank Girl for this, of course, and there's no doubt a bunch of inspiration for Lara's appearance came from there. But most directly of all, Toby took a lot of inspiration from MTV's Eon Flux animated series. This quite wonderfully done show, probably responsible for far more games than just Tomb Raider, featured many well done scenes of the hero in question gracefully mowing down scores of bad guys. And you can add some classic Hong Kong to the mix. Toby Guard's also a big fan of all that, and wants the action in Tomb Raider to be balletic in a similar way to things like Hard Boiled, A Better Tomorrow and all of that. The most obvious Hong Kong action influence, of course, is in the form of Lara's signature weapons, the dual pistols that absolutely never need to be reloaded. Inspiration also seemingly came from Swedish pop star Nene Cherry, in terms of how the character looked and moved and her general attitude. Now I don't think anyone needs an excuse to listen to Buffalo stance on repeat personally, but I can picture Toby Guard watching that video plenty of times and taking notes. And there were, apparently, aspects of the character that were based on Toby's sister, Frances. In Toby's words, these were more subconscious than anything. This is another one of those things that's become part of the character's legend over the years, but is perhaps less important in reality, alongside other Lara factoids, such as her birthday being February 14th, that were basically made up by the team on the fly whenever such questions were asked. Toby's ideas for the action were soon fully in place, but the character would go through a few more changes before being fully set in stone. How come we didn't end up with a Latin American heroine named Laura Cruz? What changed to make her a thoroughly English heroine named Lara Croft? The name Laura was the first thing to go after one of Kaur's head honchos, Jeremy Heath Smith, decided to drop it because apparently Americans, those blasted bloody Americans, had trouble saying the name Laura properly. I guess they always say Laura, don't they? So the U gets dropped and we end up with Lara Cruz. Later on in the process it was decided that the character should be a bit more UK friendly. And so Cruz is dropped, and the name Croft is chosen, apparently coming literally out of the phone book. With Lara Croft being quite the sophisticated name, she acquires the aristocratic background. Daughter of Lord Henshinley Croft, who lived a thoroughly splendid life until she was in a plane crash aged 21. The experience of being stranded in the Himalayas for two weeks drove her to drop everything and become an adventurer, mercenary, hunter and sublime master thief, writing books and articles about her experiences. This background gives the initial more Indiana Jones-esque story of Lara a sleeker, more James Bond type sheen, which will be brought further into the background when the time comes to give this character a voice. But by now, well, we're about ready to dive into the development of the game itself. So, we've basically got a character all set up and ready to go. Now, the rest should be simple. Let's go ahead and build a game around this Lara Croft and give her the design and gameplay that a hero like her wants. Except that not a whole lot of games like Tomb Raider had been attempted before. This was something new, something more complex, something that obviously did have a bit of inspiration seeping in from other areas in terms of design, but was using that for a 3D adventure, a quite different beast. Toby Guard had a team together, and he'd managed to pretty much get creative control over this project, but the making of Tomb Raider as a game was going to involve dealing with several technical and design problems. The main problem is that, initially, the Tomb Raider team's ideas were a bit too far ahead of what 1995-era hardware was capable of making. They obviously wanted the experience to be generally quite free-form, with Lara being able to move freely and so on. But this would prove to be very problematic, as programs like 3D Studio that they were using just weren't up to the making of something like that. Indeed, they were barely able to create Lara Croft in the way that she had been envisioned on paper. It was a pretty damn tricky process, and one that the programmers and the designers seriously struggled with. The ultimate solution to all of this, and one which finally freed up the project to reach its potential, was for Tomb Raider's design to essentially be a giant grid system for Lara to move on. Not as free a movement as was initially hoped for, but this is the design that would allow the game to actually be made, especially in the short time that the game had to be made in, 
After all, from the initial idea to actual release on the shelves, the creation of Tomb Raider took around about two years, which in game design terms these days is amounts to approximately nothing. Then, once Gavin Rummery had built the room editor, and Stuart Atkinson had done the same for animations, Neil Boyd and Heather Gibson were really able to work on building the game's levels at a relatively brisk pace. The grid system of Tomb Raider does give the game something of a link back towards the genre of cinematic platformers, your Prince of Persia's, Flashbacks and Other Worlds and the like, with the game being one of the first and still greatest realisations of the genre in 3D, complete with a fixed set of jumps and moves that Lara can pull off, from the more essential jumps for gaps to the various combat roles, the more graceful swan dive that still does have the odd use for avoiding boulders in parts, and of course the handstand, which doesn't have much use at all but certainly looks good. And this being a cinematic style platformer all about adventuring, there would be a large puzzle element too. Indeed, the team worked a lot on getting the puzzle elements of the various levels right before incorporating all the action in. The grid style also allowed the designers to really think big when it came to the levels themselves, certainly relative to most other games at the time. There had been other attempts at 3D cinematic style platformers, Delphine's 3D sequel to Flashback, Fade to Black, predated Tomb Raider actually by a year, but in comparison that game is quite enclosed and somewhat basic in design. There's something to be said about the moment a nascent genre opens up and can incorporate that much more creativity in how levels play and feel. Compare Wolfenstein 3D to Doom, or Bubsy 3D to Super Mario 64. Tomb Raider belongs in the same category when it comes to the more adventurous third person platformer. Over the course of development a lot of things changed, from the cosmetic to various aspects of the gameplay. A lot of people probably already know that Lara was going to have a big old braid in the first game, much like the one she eventually got in the sequel, but the team weren't able to get it right in time for it to be in the first one, it didn't move realistically and it could cause frame drops. There's also beaters where Lara has her signature sunglasses on throughout the game, but these would soon be dropped and only included in FMVs. I just want to take 7 seconds to say that I have a lot of gaming documentaries, so if you enjoy this, a like and subscribe would be wonderful. Thank you, back to it. There's some other things about the gameplay that were modified over the course of the game's creation. At one stage, dual magnums were set to be Lara's signature weapons, as opposed to the pistols she eventually ended up with, and she would have been able to aim them at two enemies at once. However, this was eventually dropped, along with the inclusion of grenades. Also, the pistols weren't always unlimited ammo. In fact, it was only in August 1996, very late in the game's development, when that change was made, and previously clips would have been dotted around the stage. So perhaps it was felt that including pistol clips would have been just way too many pickups. In the end, the pistols being unlimited does feel kind of right. At one point there also weren't any slopes in the game, and it was only late on that Lara acquired the ability to jump off of them. A lot of these various changes alongside other issues, such as the various animations, the camera, and when different angles could be triggered and so on, were hammered out through lengthy and quite heated debates and meetings, as the pressures of making the game ratcheted up further and further. While the atmosphere in the team was very friendly in and out of the office, there were times when things could get a bit gnarly. Tomb Raider's development was quite the intense process. While cause management were pretty hands off in how they treated their staff, there were a lot of long nights and not an awful lot of initial support from the game's publishers in Eidos, who repeatedly tried to push the idea of changing Lara Croft to a more typical male adventurer, or at least giving players a choice. When that didn't work, they even tried to push the idea of including a nude code for Lara. Thankfully such fins were resisted by Core, most vociferously of all by Toby Guard, who was determined to not have the game cheapened with such fins that were focused purely on titillation. A lot of Tomb Raider's initial success has been credited to his general obstinacy and refusal to compromise on his vision, even if there were some fins he did eventually have to delegate simply because the workload he'd set for himself was becoming too much as the game's deadlines drew closer. <laughs> 
The busy dev period meant that some aspects of development really didn't get a lot of time. Nathan McCree, in charge of the music and sound, had mere weeks to create basically everything in that department, and it's a wonder that the game sounds as good as it does. Tomb Raider was one of the first games, certainly in 3D, to really push the dynamic use of music, only queuing it in various areas and so on, and a lot of this was a consequence of the small time Nathan had. Speaking of sound, an audition process saw the role of Lara given to the actress Shelley Blonde, who initially read the character as more emotional, but ultimately read it in a more pragmatic, female James Bond style that, in the end, was more effective. While commitments to other projects prevented Shelley from doing voice work on Tomb Raider beyond the first game, her various grunts, groans and screams would be a part of every PlayStation era entry in the series. As would one particular grunt for pushing blocks, and a clipped but firm no. No. These were provided by Heather Gibson before the team searched for a professional voice actor, and yet they managed to stick around. Still, eventually, the game is just about done. As far as the game's commercial potential went, hopes weren't necessarily the highest for Midos. The company's CEO, Ian Livingston, admitted that despite the promising reactions magazines had to previews, they were only expecting sales of around 100,000 units for the game. Now, it should be noted that Eidos basically inherited the game that would totally change their fortunes. Core were under the purview of Jeff Brown's center gold umbrella, you know, US gold and the like, for most of Tomb Raider's development, until Eidos bought center gold in the spring of 1996, buying Core Design and Tomb Raider as a result of that. And speaking of previews, here's another little factoid. Tomb Raider was perhaps the first game to really seriously benefit from the arrival of the then still quite nascent Electronics Entertainment Expo, or E3. There was almost no word about the game at all, no real idea of its existence, until it demoed at the big show in June 1996, buoyed by how good the game had looked in previews with the brand new 3DFX cards that were going around. From that point on, the gaming press were most certainly interested, frothing at the mouth for this brand new game. We say a lot about how Lara conquered the mainstream press, and we certainly will later, but she wouldn't have done it if she hadn't already had the game in press on bended knee, even before the first game came out. There was another small potential fly in the ointment. Core did initially have a timed exclusivity deal with Sega, meaning that while the game had been developed simultaneously for both the Saturn and PlayStation, as well as MS-DOS, for a month the game would be exclusive to the Sega Saturn. On the surface, this might not have seemed like a good thing, commercially, but it turned out to be a blessing, as not only did it give the team a bit of extra time to fix bugs in the PS1 and DOS versions, but the hype that the game managed to generate on the initial Saturn release, due to the word of mouth, the rave magazine reviews, all that had happened up to that point, only increased the anticipation for the other releases, at which point the game basically caught fire. That initial 100,000 estimate turned out to be quite off the mark. The first Tomb Raider game has sold over 7 million copies to date. It single-handedly turned the nascent Eidos from a company expecting to make a yearly loss into one that was turning a profit. So with that commercial and critical success in mind, let's have a closer look at the final product itself. The first Tomb Raider presents Lara as a fully-fledged adventurer, on the hunt for a Scion at the behest of a woman named Jacqueline Natler and her Enterprise. And unlike, well, most of the entries in the series to come in all honesty, it'll mostly feature her exploring actual tombs, complete with as many puzzles, expanses and animals as you can eat. Helpfully, you can also take a quick trip into Croft Manor to get yourself familiar with the controls before diving in, learn all the jumps, have a few tumbles and so on. Sadly, Lara's butler is on vacation in the first game, but <laughs> we'll get to him soon enough, don't you worry. Playing Tomb Raider today, it's quite something to see how well this relatively early 3D adventure has held up. There's still a great wonder to be had playing it due to how big Core went with a lot of the rooms, even if this is pretty much an exclusively inside game. It's still quite something to find yourself in front of the Big Sphinx, or the Great Pyramid, to be in the Lost Valley about to come face to face with the T-Rex, or in the main room of St. Francis's Folly. 
This goes back to the opening up of a genre that I mentioned earlier. The way that these areas have been created means that the game still got something, regardless of the fidelity of the textures or whatever. It helps also that it's easy enough to navigate these areas. Tomb Raider's grid system means that it does have a pretty solid set of rules, but it's easy enough to learn these rules, and when you do that, it's easy to break down what you can see on the screen and actually find a path. That and there's a lot of secrets to find in the levels. Very much worth looking out for these, seeing as they both provide much needed pickups, and the mystery solved sound effect that accompanies their discovery always provides a little hit of serotonin. Even if it doesn't have the same freedom of movement as a lot of its contemporaries, Tomb Raider has actually aged considerably better than a lot of other third person adventures from this generation, even if it came out earlier than a lot of them. The rules of Lara Croft's movement also allow for quite fluid combat, so there's not too many problems there. Lara auto locks on enemies, and she can fire in most any position, on the ground and in the air, whether she's jumping backwards, forwards or to the side, and she can also roll directly to the opposing angle if she's in a pinch. Compared to the style of tank controls you had in a lot of PS1 era games, Lara has a lot more freedom to deal with the enemies. Which, of course, mostly consist of animals. <laughs> Poor sods. Tigers, crocodiles, gorillas, all put to the sword and promptly shipped off to Maison du Croft to most likely create some bloody rug or whatever. Some did question why Lara happened to be killing so many endangered species, although this wasn't really a thought that occurred to Toby Guard and the team at the time. With not much in the way of other humans in this game, Core needed a hierarchy of enemies, and animals were the easiest things to include in the beginning. Later in the game, the enemies become more supernatural and a lot more challenging to deal with, but you can understand that having such enemies from the very beginning would have made them a lot less special. The twists into the supernatural that the game takes, and the other twists and turns we see throughout, also inform a lot of the design choices made. The game does a fine job when it comes to caves and the more Greek or Egyptian environs we see in the first half, with the game's excellent textures, mostly taken out of historical books and encyclopedias, doing some fantastic work. But the last sections of the game offer more surprises. Atlantis, the game's final destination, is still quite a surprise. It's a place that's often thought of as being this impossibly beautiful lost city, but Core go in another direction and opt for this flat out scary body horror aesthetic, which goes quite well with the game's final enemies. It's like something out of Doom, and there's not a whole lot of other interpretations of Atlantis quite like it, in all honesty. For a game released in 1996, Tomb Raider still retains nearly all of its original wonder, it's a special moment when you first enter that lost valley, of course, and you're suddenly surrounded by dinosaurs. But moments like this will always have some magic, no matter how many times you play the game. The rules and the style of Tomb Raider, over the years, have led to the unconscious creation of, um, rituals. Things that seemingly always have to be done when you play the game. It would be wrong to not go into any new area with guns drawn and ready. Lara must be ready to add another endangered animal to her collection at a moment's notice, at all times. If you flick a switch and you don't immediately tumble away from it while the camera's cut away to the door you've just triggered, so you're already facing the other direction when it cuts back, <laughs> well, you're not playing the game correctly. That's just tradition. Although it doesn't have any effect on the gameplay, you simply have to do the odd handstand or a tumble and grab on a ledge. Lara should always be that little bit flashy, even if literally nobody else is watching. Even though we all know that climbing on top of the Midas statue's hand is a recipe for instant death, it's such a brilliantly made death that you quite simply have to do it. And when you're finished playing for the day, and obviously after saving your progress, well, it would quite simply be one to not take Lara to the highest platform that's around and send her swan dive into the floor with a scream and a quite graphic crunch. Again, this is just simple gaming tradition, that's all there is to it. 
Indeed, Lara Croft can be subjected to some really quite gruesome deaths for the time. And again, this is something that links Lara back to the rest of the cinematic platformer lineage, seeing as just about all of those old side-scrolling games feature a hero meeting their maker in a whole ton of varied, creative and often rather violent ways. The long and short of this really is that Tomb Raider's animation is still spectacular to this day, with every little bit of it being memorable, from the graceful leaps and dives to the perhaps slightly over-exaggerated panting she does when she's idle. Putting this first game in the context of the whole series, the original Tomb Raider feels almost complete. It's got the mixture of puzzles and action, it's got the dynamic sound and atmosphere, and it's got the animation and wonder. It's something to look at this game and take note of all the things that didn't really change from the first on the PS1, because the team at Core got it so right the first time around that they didn't need to fix them. Still there are the odd things here and there that wouldn't be seen again. At least on console there's the rather irritating save crystals. Now people don't like these at all. Obviously they don't like being limited in where they can save, especially in a game like this where mistakes can quite often lead to instant death. Now I think there's another reason why they're bad. Safe crystals don't ruin the levels or anything like that, but they do spoil their wonder just a little. Core Design weren't exactly stingy with them, there's a lot of safe crystals in most levels, and when you put them all together, they do kind of represent a path through the levels, to the point where if you find one, you kind of know that you have found the path you need to be on to get through. Even with this in play, you will more than likely still get lost, and it's not necessarily a bad thing to get lost in this game, even if you may end up needing to consult a walkthrough from time to time, but it's more satisfying to find the way back based on your own instincts like an adventurer, as opposed to stumbling on these blue crystals that basically join the dots up. Core listened to people's complaints about save crystals, and they were removed after this game. From the second game you could save anywhere on consoles, same as the original's MS-DOS version which also didn't have any save crystals. So the original Tomb Raider is still quite wonderful, really. You can see why it caught so much fire, and there was a lot more to it than Lara simply being a brand new female hero, or being a very sexy collection of polygons, or overly hormonal teenagers trying to position her in just that correct position to get a good look at her uh, somewhat triangular chesticles. As a game it certainly held up, everything that made the first Tomb Raider a brilliant title is as strong as ever. Really, the FMVs probably age the worst out of anything here, although that's not really something you shouldn't expect. Still, it wasn't just the excellent game that people went crazy for here. They did indeed go highly potty over Lara Croft herself, this brash, well-spoken hero. The first incredibly famous character from video games who was thoroughly identifiably human, with human proportions, in human areas. So, you know, more than the likes of Mario had been. And unlike Mario, a character that wasn't purely focused on children as an audience, Lara Croft herself was going to become a celebrity, and Core and Eidos were definitely going to make the most out of that, even if not everyone was going to like it. 1997 was essentially Lara Croft's year. This virtual character was all of a sudden everywhere. It didn't take long for everything from the mainstream press to the more seedy magazines to pick up on Lara Croft, and by the summertime you could see her in all sorts of different places. British style magazine The Face stuck her on their front cover in June, and U2 stuck her on videos for their Pop Mart World Tour, where images of Lara would accompany performances of Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me, Kill Me, with the Irish mega band later providing Elevation for the inevitable Lara Croft Tomb Raider film in 2001. Eidos and Core would be more than happy to take advantage of Lara's popularity, albeit with a mission to not spread her too thinly. As mentioned before, Lara had the obvious advantage of being a fair bit more human than previous famous video game characters, and even more obviously, she had a sex appeal. She was the first video game character to really have any kind of sex appeal, certainly more so than a fat Italian plumber in any case. And there'd certainly be plenty of Lara Croft centric marketing that would concentrate on these… assets. But there's a bit more to it than that still. 
In Lara Croft, IDOS had a character which they could essentially market in the same way that you would sell a real person. Much like how a record company sells a pop star or a group, IDOS were able to do that with Lara. There were many interviews of Lara Croft kicking about back in the day, the almost surreal parade of real people trying to get words from a virtual character. But then IDOS kind of had a way to make a link between these worlds, the introduction as early as 1997 of real life Lara Crofts, actresses playing the character, first Rona Mitra and then the model Nell McAndrew. The link between Lara Croft and the Spice Girls led wave of girl power that hit the UK and later the rest of the world in 1997 is pretty clear, and both Lara and the Spice Girls are quite similar in how they managed to keep in front, always seemingly a step ahead of their imitators by virtue of being that bit more careful. And rest assured there would be plenty of those imitators trying to ride Lara's coattails almost immediately. There was immediate talk of a Lara Croft movie, of course, with an initial release date set for 1999, and of course there were big money brand deals. Companies would happily spend millions to try and recruit Lara Croft, although often even the very biggest of them weren't quite able to manage it. The two ad campaigns that tend to stick out in most people's minds are the ones for Sayat and LucasAid. Now the LucasAid partnership is by far Lara's biggest, she was essentially the face of the erstwhile brand of UK sports drinks for a good few years from 1998 onwards, front and centre in both TV and print in a deal that cost a solid 7 figure chunk of change. It's a perfect tie-in for Lara really, and hey, it's two British icons working together too. Sure as hell beats Superfrog as far as LucasAid were concerned I'm sure. Drinking LucasAid may not end up giving you Lara Croft's moves, but it may be worth a try, I suppose. Indeed, the brands were so close together that around the time the first Tomb Raider film was released in 2001, LucasAid even temporarily changed their name, as part of the campaign, to LaraZade. That's how close they were. 17 years later, LucasAid would become LaraZaid again for a short time as part of a tie-in with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, so clearly this campaign stuck long in the memory they certainly weren't unhappy with it. The partnership with Lara and Sayat is perhaps not quite as successful in retrospect, although still memorable regardless. It's still Lara going around in the usual FMVs and so on, doing Lara Croft fins. Only now she does it all while driving around in blooming Sayats everywhere. Now clearly the idea of Miss Croft being able to use these middling French hatchbacks to traverse the roughest of jungle and desert terrain that she was accustomed to was about as fantastical as the mummies and centaurs she drew her pistols on in her games, but the pairing of Lara Croft and Sayat was still very irresistible for the company to the tune of several million pounds. She had a cachet in the 1990s that no video game star had ever come even remotely close to before, so perhaps the odd silly fin like this can be forgiven. With Lara Croft the playbook was basically being written as it all happened. There were some other Lara Croft exploits outside of her regular games that haven't necessarily stood the test of time, but are worth looking back on. There's the Visa campaign, of course. Now you wouldn't think that Lara Croft would be in and around too many locations where ATMs are commonplace, but if she does find one then, well, I suppose she can always count on her plastic to come through for her. What about the idea of Lara Croft being an international pop star? <laughs> Could have happened, you know. There were two Lara Croft albums, 1998's Come Alive and 2001's Female Icon, with the first one headed up by lead single, um, Getting Naked. The music on said albums was largely done by Dave Stewart, as in him who isn't Annie Lennox from the Arithmics, with Lara's vocals provided by Rona Mitra on both albums, and the music itself is pretty electronic in nature with some rockiness here and there and, mm, let's be blunt, it's not very good, but then with Dave Stewart at the helm I may not need to tell you that. The albums and singles didn't exactly set the music world on fire, but these are still quite odd artefacts of Lara mania as are the Lara Croft brand athletic clothes that Cor and Idos would also try to push back in the day, allowing you to get the Lara look for yourself. Interesting idea, one can say. I mean it's not like Lara Croft was wearing anything exotic now was she? 
And returning to music, there's also the Tribute to Lara Croft album from 1997, featuring songs from the likes of Underworld, Apollo 440, Moby, Faith No More and Depeche Mode. Why try to make Lara Croft a pop star when you've got big guns like Lee's chucking music your way? And it'd be silly not to mention the Tomb Raider comics too. They started in 1999, created by Dark Horse, and kind of took a life on their own over six years. Envisioned initially as a straighter adaptation of the video game stories, Lara in comic book form would soon cross over with other Dark Horse properties, most notably Witchblade. The general revival of Tomb Raider in the 2010s would see the Raider comic return in 2014. You know, just like Lara's aid. And of course, there was always one brand Lara was inextricably linked to more than any other, the one always in the background. That being, of course, PlayStation. She was the system's mascot in many ways, even if it was in an unofficial capacity and despite not even really being exclusive to the system. Lara and PlayStation were utterly linked and Sony's ad people would certainly make use of that link, sometimes in rather controversial ways. Who can forget the iconic image of Lara Croft attached to a youngster's wall in a clear Jesus Christ pose? This picture, done by the French studio TBWA, because of course it's disruption, certainly ruffled a few feathers due to these biblical invocations of everything from Jesus to John Lennon, because it may well have felt at the time like Lara was indeed bigger than Jesus. Speaking of controversy, Lara Croft was also a hot topic of discussion in feminist circles and publications. Some felt that Lara not only provided an icon for female gamers in a generally quite masculine environment, but also gave male gamers a means of finding a more feminine side. Others, most vocally of all Jermaine Greer, felt she was essentially the purest embodiment of the male gaze there had yet been, incredulous that such discussion could be had about a virtual character created entirely by men. Even if, you know, that wasn't the case. It's worth noting that despite both Lee's misgivings and all the big old four isn't Lara sexy print inches that were around at the time, female gamers were hardly alienated by her. In 2000, Idos estimated that 20 to 25% of Tomb Raider's player base was female. While Idos would often try to have their cake and eat it when it came to marketing Lara as either a feminist icon or a pinup girl, this is a pretty high stat that is bared out by the character's last ability and how people who grew up with Lara Croft tend to feel about her as a character. There's actually probably less debate about her feminist icon status now than there was back in the day. And yet, one other person had other reasons to feel unhappy about the mainstream success of Lara Croft, in spite of the Jesus ads, the LucasAid millions, the bad music and the front covers on just about everything from Newsweek to Rolling Stone. And that person was Toby Gard. Toby, the creator of Lara and the lead of the almighty first game, was more and more uncomfortable with the way that Lara was heading. He especially didn't care for the adverts and press slots that centred entirely on her sex appeal without paying attention to anything else, and being that this was the middle of the 90s there was certainly a lot of lows. The inevitable Babe of the Year awards and virtual swimsuit issues from the gaming press probably also annoyed. It wasn't that Toby didn't view his creation as having sex appeal, but to him this was based in her power, free spirit, personality, her agency. Not her tits, which were made out of polygons. And also triangular. Some have also wondered if the possible sisterly origin for Lara Croft gave all the shots of her with little to nothing on for the FHM and Loaded crowds even more of a nickiness for Toby. But who can really say? And well, having creative control over the first game obviously didn't translate to having control over the character after the fact, all of this was very much out of Toby's hands. He could certainly question it and get angry about it, but in the end he didn't really have much of a say. So he had two choices, really. Continue on at the head of Tomb Raider, complete with a sequel that was being fast-tracked for release in late 1997, because the series has got to come out annually now, despite all the growing misgivings he had about his own character's journey. Or he could walk away. And that's exactly what he did. This early on in the Tomb Raider story, Toby Gard leaves Core in 1997 and moves on to other projects, with lead programmer Paul Douglas also departing with him. <laughs> 
He doesn't really return to Lestori until much later as a consultant for Crystal Dynamics when they take control. He's never again at the head of Lara Croft. Many people have always asked him if he regretted his decision. After all, by leaving Core when he did, Toby left millions on the table in the shape of royalties and so on. To his credit, Toby has never admitted to any regrets whatsoever. Lara will move on and continue to climb up into the stratosphere without Toby Guard, of course, but the series has lost its creator. That last passage essentially was trying to see Toby Guard's departure from his perspective, the reasons at the time why he decided to jump ship, pissed off with the way the character was being marketed, and even more pissed off that he'd had no say in it. He'd tried as much as possible to talk to marketing about how Lara should be pushed and sold, but they waved him away. He's a developer, it's not his department. That's his perspective. From the perspective of Kor and the rest of the team, Guard's departure was an absolute hammer blow. Everyone had tried to convince him and Douglas to stay, thinking that it was absolute madness to leave the whole thing behind at this moment, when the game's not just selling like hotcakes, but your creation is the absolute number one thing on everybody's lips, over Mario, over Sonic, over Doom, over everybody. Jeremy Heath Smith, who'd employed Guard since he was a teenager, was desperate to keep him on not just for the cachet as the hottest name in gaming, but out of a personal concern for Toby. Don't throw away something that's going to set you up for life. But it just wasn't happening. The frustration of Lara being taken away from him, the constant temptation to go elsewhere with job offers coming in left and right, and a bullheaded brashness that only really comes with youth, saw Guard leave. In an interview for a Eurogamer feature on Tomb Raider's history with Wesley Ian Paul, Gavin Rummery describes the utterly bitter two months or so spent in an office with Guard and Douglas, as initial work began on Tomb Raider 2 and the pair just refused to do anything, staging their own little protest. There was something of an atmosphere as Guard would rant on about how there simply should not be a sequel. Eventually, Rummery took his computer out of the room and plonked it in the main area with the rest of the team, and not long after, Guard and Douglas left for good. For the rest of the Tomb Raider team, the royalties they made would be life-changing. As tough as the work was, and the crunch for Tomb Raider 2, made in only about 8 months, would perhaps be even worse than the original, and as much as the developers were often kept in the background while management and journos were the ones who got to go to the lavish launch parties, the press junkets to Egypt and the Natural History Museum and so on for the Tomb Raider games, these folks were now suddenly getting massive checks almost every month. As much as Jeremy Heath Smith did his best Jimmy Conway impression and told the team to not go stupid with all of the money, a lot of them obviously did. Massive holidays, luxury sports cars to the point where apparently Coors Car Park was the most ridiculous site in Derby, Lord knows what else. In the same Eurogamer feature, Andy Sankham, who was in the team from TR2 onwards, describes one month's royalty check for Tomb Raider 3 as totalling a whopping £300,000. Of course, he spent the lot. Some were more sensible, of course, but others? Well, they went out there and splashed it, so yeah. Naturally, the Tomb Raider team, unconsciously or not, generally acted like they were the cock of the walk in core design's offices, which most assuredly rankled with the company's other teams busy at work on games such as Fighting Force, which didn't exactly do as well as the Tomb Raider games. It's the sort of thing where, retrospectively at least, some people realise that they may have acted like a bit of a tit. But hey, it happens. A lot of the marketing we've just talked about was, of course, in the service of Tomb Raider 2, set for release in late 1997. There wasn't any question of there not being a sequel, really. Ideas for it were being bandied around even while the first game was still in development. One immediate thing that changed was it wasn't going to be a multi-platform game anymore, at least not on consoles. Sony had very quickly moved to sign Tomb Raider up as a PlayStation exclusive as soon as the game caught fire. So yeah, no Sega Saturn version this time, I'm afraid. Sony's signing up of Lara also killed any thoughts on a possible Nintendo 64 port of the first game, which may or may not have been worked on a little. PC gamers at the least wouldn't be missing out, Lara would still be coming to computers again, with the title now switching from MS-DOS to Windows 9X. 
With the engine and all the general foundations happily in place, and not requiring much in the way of changing aside from graphical improvements and even bigger expanses and surroundings, focus shifts somewhat to putting in a lot of the things that could have been in the original but didn't quite make it. Lara Croft now has her signature braid, for example. It waves about in a happily natural way, something that's quite impressive for the time the game was released. Vehicles are now a part of the gameplay too. In one area, Lara will be able to basically replace her entire bottom half, for that is how it was coded, with a snowmobile. And also, unlike the first time, Lara will actually be spending a fair bit of time outside. The game will not entirely be inside caves and various other internal surroundings. Some other little moves have been added here and there, with Lara now gaining the ability to roll in mid-air and use rope slides. Flares become a part of the game for use in darker areas, the grenades finally come into play with the help of a grenade launcher, and a harpoon gun makes underwater combat possible. Some other things are rejigged. As mentioned before, the save crystals are gone from the sequel, while secrets now take the form of various idols and dragons. Collecting all of the little statues in a level gives Lara a big chunk of much needed supplies all at once. And of course, Lara won't just be restricted to exploring ancient tombs for the sequel. It's kind of funny really, some people categorise complaints about Lara not actually raiding tombs in her games as a more recent series development, when it's really not. While Lara will obviously still be hunting for ancient artefacts, this sequel will take her everywhere from the Great Wall of China to Venice, an offshore oil rig, hills and monasteries in Tibet, and finally some grand fantastical temples at the end. Not a whole lot of tombs here, really. The enemies will be different too. There's not as many endangered species to take out this time around, and instead Lara will be doing a lot of fighting against a mafia organisation, with plenty of men to kill. All that said, the game's still very much going to have a solid balance between puzzles and action. There's not an awful lot of need to really fix the building blocks that Toby Guard and the game's first team had created. Indeed, even with Guard gone, the original TR team was still mostly intact and working on this sequel. With Lara Croft being such a big deal now, and with only a year to create this sequel, Core didn't make too much in the way of radical changes to the game. Lara was so big at the time that it wasn't going to need an awful lot to keep ahead of the incoming waves of imitators, and there'd be plenty of those in the coming years. Even Eidos themselves would try and capture the magic again with the Death Trap Dungeon games, third person adventures with a fighting fantasy licence that had a lot in common with Tomb Raider without necessarily being full on clones, but people never got behind them in the same way. Other more blatant imitators, such as the PC-only flop Space Bunnies Must Die, fell by the wayside almost immediately. Whilst even Lara's inspirations were quite literally tipping the hat to her in the form of Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine, one of the better Tomb Raider clones out there. It almost seems like the Tomb Raider format was tailor-made for a licensed title, even. We have games based on the fifth element, as well as Aladdin Nazira's Revenge, that take a lot of inspiration from Tomb Raider. Even the most macho gaming hero of them all was trying to get a piece of the action. Say hello to Duke Nukem Time to Kill and Land of the Babes, the third person Duke games with more than a little bit of Lara about them. And we obviously can't forget about Legacy of Kane's Soul Reaver, which for most people is probably the best Tomb Raider-esque game of them all, at least on PS1, and it was made by the same folks who'd take the series over years later, Crystal Dynamics. The TV series Relic Hunter is also worthy of mention. This Canadian production from 1999 starring Tia Carrere is, in many ways, a Tomb Raider TV series in all but name, and it's actually not bad for all of that. Let's face it, it's better than any of the bloody films. Tomb Raider 2 didn't exactly need a lot of help this time around when it came to generating hype, of course. It was guaranteed to fly off the shelves, gaming magazines devoted an absolutely staggering amount of coverage to it, and it reviewed handsomely. It sold around 6.8 million copies, making it just as big a deal as the original, and is the second best-selling PS1 title in the UK behind the original Rayman. Even with Toby Guard gone and all the marketing everywhere and perhaps just the faintest hints that Lara could be losing a portion of her soul, or that her own developers may be sagging just that little bit, this is still very much Lara Croft at the height of her powers, and the quality of the sequel is going to bear that out.
it's going to be everything that people wanted out of a sequel, really. So let's not wait any longer to get stuck in. So nobody was asking for Tomb Raider's sequel to reinvent the wheel, they were simply chomping at the bit for more of Lara Croft's adventures, and in Tomb Raider 2 that's exactly what everyone got. The sequel's still excellent opening FMV, Wilhelm screams and all, tells the story of Lara's latest obscure object of desire, the ancient dagger of Jeanne, which turns its host into an almighty dragon. As such it has been sealed away for all eternity, but Lara's still very much interested in it for herself. And hey, it's probably better if she gets it instead of the Fiamma Nera crime family boss Marco Bartoli, who has his own designs on getting the dagger and presumably becoming some Shadow esque reptilian Don. Forget about knives, guns and bombs, Marco wants to breathe fire at anyone trying to muscle in on his patch, including our hero. Before any adventures though, one must go home, and Lara's home is certainly a good first sign of how much bigger this sequel is going to be. The original home wasn't much more than a few rooms, really, and you couldn't go outside. Now? Well, there's an entire mansion and gardens for you to explore. You can become familiar with the new voice of Lara, played this time around by Judith Gibbons. Her take on the character is even more posher and sophisticated than Shelley Blonde's. There's an assault course where you get to learn all the ropes once again and set a time, and Lord knows that trying to get through the course as fast as you can, Krypton Factor style, is kind of addictive. There's a ballroom complete with music you can put on to accompany your various tumbles, a huge garden maze that, if you learn it right, grants you access to a secret area inside the house, darkened parts where you can toy with flares. Oh, and there's now an old butler tottering around, groaning in pain whenever Lara bumps into him and his tea tray, which if I'm playing the game is very often. Thus birth is given to the greatest Lara Croft ritual of them all. You're simply not playing the game right if you don't go into the walk-in freezer, wait for the faithful retainer to follow you in there, jump over him and shut him in, usually with his front half clipping out. A new innovation in butler freezer technology, one might call it. You can easily lose a good chunk of time just screwing around in Lara's home before you even start the actual game. And the game itself? Yes, it delivers on the promise. 17 levels that will take you all around the world and will just about stretch the core gameplay of the original as far as it can go. By and large, these levels are a great deal bigger and more varied. Something that might have taken 45 minutes, a relatively big level in the original, can take double that in the sequel, because everything's that much more grand and the difficulty certainly peaks a lot higher. By the time Lara manages to reach the Temple of Jeanne, she'll have to be at her absolute best to conquer the almost constant puzzles and traps the game's chucking in her direction. She'll also have to be pretty damn good at swimming too, seeing as going underwater happens way more in the sequel, with some levels almost entirely set in the depths. And she'll have to be pretty handy with her weapons as well, seeing as Tomb Raider 2 features a great deal of enemies that can actually shoot back. None of this would have been possible without the original, of course. If you played the original, you'll already be thoroughly familiar with how this game plays as we've got the same foundations here. But nothing like that needed fixing, and Tomb Raider 2 triumphs simply because it's a damn fine and well-made sequel. The vibe is perhaps a little different here and there what with the lack of tombs and a fair bit more action, but the game does use that to provide some very high intensity set pieces that weren't necessarily in the original, such as the timed speedboat section in Venice, or the snowmobile courses in the Tibetan foothills, or starting without any guns in the offshore rig and having to outwit enemies. Other set pieces have more in common with the original, such as the secret area in the very first level where, if you safely descend down into a chasm, you can duke it out with two tyrannosaurs. The game's still got that great feeling of wonder and exploration, and it only gets stronger as you get further into the game and things get more fantastical and supernatural. The graphics have taken a bit of an upgrade compared to the original, not a massive one, but the game still works as a package in all of its shaky texture glory, even if there are the odd points where it makes the old PS1 chug a little bit. The underwater levels, set in and around an old wreck called La Maria Doria, are particularly striking in how they use lighting and PS1 style textures. Shockingly, such fins along with the generally accurate and speedy swimming controls make these underwater levels quite fun, 
which let's face it is kind of a video game rarity. The Barkhand Monastery is also full of some quite incredible creations for a PS1 game, while also providing another new fin for the series. The monks will actually help you take down Bartley's henchmen, and there's several points where they'll be more than able to beat them in a fight despite the Fiaminera packing heat. Just be careful not to harm them in any way at all, because if one bullet even slightly wins a monk, they'll all be hostile towards you for the rest of the level. And if you want to take part in all of these fights, the game's auto-locking guns make that rather easy to do. Be careful. But really, and this isn't always the case in games like this, Tomb Raider 2 is best of all at the end. Its final stages are absolutely the most memorable, much like how the body horror aesthetic in the first game's Atlantis was so much more striking than a lot of what had come before. The ultra-tough fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants Temple of Jeanne has already been mentioned, but the floating islands afterwards are even more memorable, and just, again, flat-out weird with their islands surrounded by total nothingness and enemies slowly flying in your direction. I highly appreciate the game's taking risks in this manner, to be honest. It doesn't really play it safe with the settings at all. Then, at last, you face Marco Bartoli in dragon form in the final battle. You pull a dagger out from his belly after blasting hundreds of rounds into his face, and that's it. The temple blows up, you've got the dagger, and you've won. Or have you? Well, no, because the best bit of all is, in fact, the epilogue. Lara's back at home admiring her trophy, but the remainder of the Fiaminera's thugs have come to get their revenge. For killing their leader? For killing all their mates? For killing all those animals because they're also Peter members on the side? <laughs> Who knows? Anyway, Lara Croft, in her best evening dress, rushes to the gun cabinet, grabs a shotgun, and kicks ass once more. You can even stick some music on to welcome the thugs to your humble abode as you promptly shoot them in the face. It's a brilliant final touch, and indeed it was one that kind of came at the last minute. The team wasn't too sure if the last battle against the dragon was the most satisfying ending, and they were perhaps right to think that. If there is one thing that the original Tomb Raider games do struggle with, it's boss fights. To be honest, the first game's fights were pretty damned easy, even the last one against Natla. The dragon is one of the best of them, but it is kind of still a matter of doing a lot of circling around the beast and blasting away. Once you get the rhythm, you could even do it with your regular pistols, if you wanted to take a load of time over it. And so, they came up with this epilogue, set back at the manner you're probably already familiar with for all that training in the beginning, only darker and filled up with enemies, all of whom you have to kill. And holy hell does it work. A fantastic ending to the game, complete with a final and very well earned take that tease before the credits to those desperate to see a bit of skin from Lara. I would go as far to say that it's one of the most memorable finales on the entire PlayStation. Don't you think you've seen enough? Tomb Raider 2 is a classic example of a sequel where for the most part, everything's just that much bigger and better. Without the rush to do everything from scratch and with all the tools already in place, the team now has a chance to flourish and flex. Nathan McCree even gets to make a proper full score for the game this time around, although it will still be a dynamic one, music queuing in at appropriate moments and the game still keeping a lot of great sound and atmosphere, very cinematic. It's also a sequel that seriously managed to deliver on an absolute ton of hype. The marketing that Core and Eidos had done meant that anticipation for the game was at an absolute fever pitch when it was released in November of 1997. And where so many sequels can fall short when confronted with such a level of excitement, Tomb Raider 2 completely stuck the landing. It's an absolutely outstanding sequel, the game that fully established Lara Croft as one of the single biggest forces in gaming at the time, one that had changed so much about gaming in that short space of time, making an almost real, relatively speaking, video game hero be on top for basically the first time ever. Lara Croft had turned the world of video games on its head, and Tomb Raider 2, certainly from a gaming perspective, still probably represents the high watermark for the series. It'd never quite get this good again. <laughs>
Following the development of Tomb Raider 2, most of the original Tomb Raider team broke up and moved on to other projects. They felt, understandably perhaps, that Tomb Raider 2 was as far as they could push the game with the tools and engine that they had, and that if they were to continue, they needed two years at least to make a sequel worth their while. That and they were also thoroughly burnt out. They'd gone all out with pretty much no breaks on Tomb Raider for two to three years by this point. Some of them had lost marriages over it, others barely had a chance to go home in all of that time. More than anything, the request for extra time on the sequel was about giving the team a chance to return to some degree of normality. However, Core and Didos were less keen on giving them that time. With Tomb Raider 2 selling millions, the plan was, as ever, to push straight on and make another sequel for the last quarter of 1998. That wasn't really enough time for the original team, and so they decided, by and large, to leave Lara Croft behind. They'd been doing nothing but Lara Croft and Tomb Raider for two years or more, after all. So even if once again they may well have been leaving significant chunks of change on the table in terms of royalties for the following games in the series and all of that, well, you can't exactly blame them. And in the end, Jeremy Heath-Smith did convince them to stay with Core. The story at the time was that the original team were going to be working on an all-new Tomb Raider game for the next generation, although this was not the case really. Instead, a big chunk of the team would set to work on Project Eden for the next three years, a project headed up by Gavin Romery that came out for the PS2 in 2001. However, the departure of an old team means that there's an opportunity for a new one. The new team, consisting of producer Troy Horton and a whole host of other core folks such as Vicky Arnold, Andy Sankum, Peter Connolly and Phil Chapman in various roles, means that Tomb Raider 3 has more staff than ever dedicated to its production, complete with Nathan McCree sticking around to provide the music. And even if there's little chance of the third Tomb Raider game doing all that much in the way of innovating, considering the amount of time the team had to make it in, they've got more than enough time to do good work with what's there. There's enough time to do a few little things, of course. Lara gets a brand new sprint move, the game gets more of a non-linear structure with players able to choose where Lara can go next at certain junctures, and a whole bunch of improvements are made to the enemy's AI. Whereas generally speaking enemies didn't do too much aside from shoot at you in the first two games, now they can do things like call for backup or shut off rooms if they discover Lara mucking about. Tomb Raider 3 as such does have the most in-depth action yet in the series, and there are moments where it might just be better for Lara if she doesn't simply go in all guns blazing and tries to take a stealthier approach. Said AI changes were made with a nod towards GoldenEye 007, and they do add a little bit of a puzzling element to the action. In a similar vein to Tomb Raider 2, the third game, subtitled Adventures of Lara Croft, will see Lara taking a big old trip around the world in search of artefacts crafted from four pieces of a meteorite that possesses significant spiritual power. Not that Lara is too much bothered about doing much except keeping them in her trophy room for admiring, but you can count on these artefacts potentially being used for evil in the one hands, so again it's better she just has them. Just Try not to think about what could happen if Lara decides to turn evil someday, eh? Anyway, she'll be going to various places. The journey starts in India, and from there Lara can travel to either the South Pacific, London, or Nevada in the order she desires, before the journey finishes up in Antarctica. Graphically, these environments will look stronger than ever. A few adjustments have been made to the good old grid system in order to try and make things like the jungles of India or the rooftops and spires of London town far more realistic than they had appeared in the previous two games, and the lighting is only going to get more dramatic. All that aside, mind you, Tomb Raider 3 is still fundamentally very close to the two games that came before it. It is in no way a drastic upheaval, as there simply wasn't enough time to do anything like that. Tomb Raider 3 is not the beginning of the end or anything like that, but it perhaps is the end of the beginning. It is the moment when the series, at least in PS1 form, starts a gradual decline, although it is still pretty bloody high up there. Most people are still pretty happy with it, and it still sells millions of copies. People love Lara Croft, no matter what, 
Yes, magazines may have wondered a little bit about the series generally not moving forward too much with the third game, but they still gave it jolly good reviews. It's only really when you look at the whole series in context that you can point to Tomb Raider 2 as the moment when the series plateaued, and it wasn't going to get any bigger than that. For Tomb Raider 3, everything is still generally fine. A lot of the marketing campaigns I've mentioned previously were in the service of Tomb Raider 3, and not many people had gotten tired of Lara yet. If she wasn't on TV drinking Lucasaid or driving French hatchbacks, she was at E3 1998 in a virtual capacity being asked questions by a captivated audience, or Nell McAndrew was busy doing tons of work as the real life Lara, appearing at press events and being interviewed on the television. Make no mistake, Lara Croft was still everywhere. Now my personal opinion of the game is that it's nowhere near the first two titles. The levels aren't quite as memorable this time around, often just being huge and maze-like, rather than actually justifying their size with immersion and grandiose set pieces like the first two games. Such things kind of belie the third game's origins, as it was initially supposed to be something along the lines of a spin-off, essentially a pack of extra levels, until the amount of ideas the new team had warranted shifting the game's development towards it being a full-blown sequel. It does feel like the balance in this one has very noticeably shifted in terms of action over puzzles, rather than really being satisfying in both areas, and sometimes the game's just completely unfair when it comes to difficulty, even more so than the first two. Also, save crystals make an unwelcome return. They're better implemented seeing as they're now an inventory item, but it's kind of cruel to have limited saves in a game this challenging. Again, that level of challenge probably comes from the initial idea of this being more like an expansion pack, or a bigger expansion pack, instead of a full-blown sequel. There's kind of no difficulty curve at all in Tomb Raider 3, it just throws you right in at the deep end. God help you if it's your first Raider experience. Now with all that said, Tomb Raider 3 is still a perfectly good Tomb Raider game, and it does certainly have some very good moments in the action department, but it's not quite a great game. It doesn't have the same wonder and power that the first two games possess. But hey, if you still like to mercilessly torture old Winston, you can now shoot the poor farting butler to ribbons in the grounds of Lara's mansion. And I think we can all agree that feature's worth the recommended retail price all on its own. And then, once again, the Tomb Raider team had another year to make the fourth title. The machine absolutely must continue to whirr. The Lara Croft juggernaut is only getting bigger. There's more ad campaigns, works beginning in earnest on the Tomb Raider film starring Angelina Jolie, that's aiming to be 2001's biggest blockbuster. The old games are only continuing to stack up big numbers, especially as they take deserved places in the Platinum and Greatest Hits collections. If you are on the outside and in the mainstream, you may well think that Lara Croft is in utterly rude health. In the offices of Core Design, however, that's not really the case. The new Tomb Raider team, two years down the road, are starting to get pretty fatigued as well. They have also been doing absolutely nothing but Lara for all this time, and they are still essentially working on the original building blocks created by the first team. Seeing as they have to keep to this annual schedule, it's not like they've really been able to do a whole lot to change those building blocks and really put their own footprint on the series. If you didn't know any better, you probably wouldn't think that the personnel for the series had changed at all over the years, even though essentially a whole new team had taken over the running of it. The Tomb Raider team were irritated, frustrated, and in the words of Andy Sankum, they were bored of looking at Lara Croft's avatar all day, every day. And so they made a decision that Core and Eidos' management weren't going to like. There's only one reason why the Tomb Raider team was able to make the decision they did. Core Design's hands-off management structure. They were open door, they trusted that the team would happily do their thing, and there wasn't an awful lot in the way of supervision when compared to a lot of other companies, especially when it comes to a big product like Tomb Raider. They didn't know about the desire the team had not just to leave Tomb Raider behind, but to shut the door on Tomb Raider forever. In their words, they wanted to kill Lara Croft. And so they did. The end of the fourth game, Tomb Raider The Last Revelation, sees Lara Croft trapped in a giant cave-in, and this time, there's no way out for her. It's all over. <laughs>
As the story goes, a very loud shout of FUCK erupted from Jeremy Heathsmith's office when he saw the FMV in question. By the time Jeremy Heathsmith found out that the Tomb Raider team were going to kill Lara Croft, it was too late to change the game. Stories of his reaction to the news are mixed. Some said that Jeremy took it philosophically and was okay with it, while others have said that he took the Tomb Raider team into a room for a thoroughly detailed bollocking and to desperately see if there was any way that things could be changed. I have to imagine that the latter account is the most accurate one, but Jeremy wasn't able to make the team change their mind and in any case, there wasn't enough time to. Cor and Idos weren't exactly going to let the team get off scot-free however, and we'll get to that in a little bit, but ultimately, they went with the team's plan to kill off Lara. Hopefully at least the fourth game would give her the send-off she deserved. And well, the last revelation is a pretty good Tomb Raider game, all told. It's the first one developed by the new team that starts out as a fully-fledged sequel, rather than becoming one in the middle of development, and in many ways it's that age-old chestnut, a back-to-the-roots game. You know, much like how an old band declares that their latest album's going to take them back to the music that made them big in the first place. Put simply, Lara's done a whole lot of world travelling, and in the last two games she hasn't done much in the way of raiding tombs. Well, the fourth game's going to feature basically nothing but Raid in Tombs, although there will of course be an antagonist. This time it's a man named Werner von Croy, Lara's former mentor. Indeed, the first levels of the game will feature an even younger Lara in the process of learning the ropes from Werner, providing the first playable origin story for the character. In design, the game pulls back from the heavy action focus that Tomb Raider 3 had. The last revelation features much more in the way of puzzling, very much in the vein of the very first game. On PlayStation, it just about pushes the old engine as far as it can go. The graphics try to make Lara as animated as possible, and try to remove as much of her original, more polygonal look as it was possible to do. The PC version is a fully dedicated one for the first time, and as such looks far better than the PS1 title, while the all new Sega Dreamcast version, now possible because Sony's exclusivity agreement on consoles had one out, is more akin to the PC version than the PS1. All of this wasn't necessarily enough for reviewers and the like to continue to question if Lara Croft's adventures were starting to now feel a little bit dated, but the last revelation still generally reviewed well despite all of that. It still sold around 5 million copies, less than the last three instalments but hardly bad. Even if some folks might have been getting a bit tired of Lara Croft, they weren't completely done with her quite yet. And Idos and Kor certainly weren't done with her either, even though Lara was now a past tense person trapped in the ruins of a Great Pyramid. The team that killed Lara Croft still had to work on another instalment in the series, the final one on the original PlayStation, and the final game in this video. The yearly schedule must continue, after all. There's also the beginning of work on a brand new Tomb Raider game, with a brand new team, for the upcoming PlayStation 2. But that's a subject for another time. For now, well, if the Tomb Raider team were sick of Lara Croft when they were working on the last revelation, you can imagine how utterly sick of her they were when they were working on Tomb Raider 5 Chronicles. It's the dreaded flashback game. The plot is set at Lara's funeral, and the mourners are recounting their various Lara stories. And you get to play out those stories. Great, eh? <laughs> it's a flashback game in terms of plot, and it's a flashback game in terms of development. Chronicles is essentially a game filled with various ideas that were left on the cutting room floor over the course of developing the previous four games. Lara gets a couple of new moves and toys, including a grappling hook, but there is absolutely nothing new here whatsoever, and the stink of contractual obligation is very strong with this one. You can't really blame them, can you? For gamers, Chronicles was most certainly the moment where Lara's decline became thoroughly noticeable. There's really no reason at all why the game should have happened beyond having to meet this annual schedule. It's a late period PS1 title that had the feeling of a game which should have been released years previously, and by this stage the whole Tomb Raider engine was completely outdated. The reviews were by far the worst in the series to date, and the game only sold 1.5 million copies. Very poor by Lara Croft standards. But all that said, it's not exactly a major failure for the series. 
This is a game that came out in late 2000, after all, and by this time less and less people were paying attention to games released on the PS1 in favour of the imminent new generation. As a matter of fact, Chronicles was released at basically the exact same time that the PlayStation 2 was released, and some might wonder if that was a way of basically burying the fin. In any case, people generally saw the title as the perfunctory game that it was, almost as if it was a bonus release of sorts, and it didn't do an awful lot of damage to the Tomb Raider's reputation. That was obviously to come with the Angel of Darkness. But for now, we close the book on Tomb Raider and Lara Croft's PS1 days, as the Tomb Raider teams move on to various other projects, in and out of core. Look up just about anyone who worked on the Tomb Raider PS1 games and you'll find someone with a fine list of titles to their name. Usually you'll find someone who's perfectly willing to reminisce about the glory days of Lara Croft 2. Members of the various Tomb Raider teams have reunited several times at Expos and the like to talk about their experiences, share war stories and go back through the good old days. They'll mostly all be happy to go through the game again. However, Toby Guard is not one of those people. He very rarely speaks of Tomb Raider, and usually rejects any requests for interviews. Toby had a pretty tough time following up on his creation. He left Core, he made a new studio from the ground up complete with fellow Raider alumni Paul Douglas, and set to work on a game called Galleon, which was first announced in 1997. Said game, essentially Elevator pitched as the man behind Lara Croft's brand new third person action adventure, would go through years of development hell before finally arriving on the Xbox in 2004. Again however, that is perhaps a story for another day, along with some of the horrors that awaited Lara Croft on the PS2, when everything Tomb Raider well and truly went to pot. That's not something I intend to revisit immediately, of course. There are other things to do, other interesting stories in games to tell. But I'm glad to finally give this one the time that it needed. And I wish all of you budding raiders, explorers, and even the ones who spent way, way too much time poring over the details of a polygonal woman's behind, a thoroughly pleasant bye for now.